All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning everyone and welcome to your webinar, Superannuation Tips and Tricks. In today's webinar, Tracy is going to cover some superannuation topics that many small businesses get wrong. And hopefully these tips and tricks will ensure you have a compliant payroll when it comes to superannuation. My name is Vicky and I'll be hosting today's webinar. Today's session will run for approximately 40 minutes. Questions can be submitted at the end of the webinar and the answers will be sent out to all attendees along with a recording of the webinar. Please note we cannot guarantee to answer all questions. Our presenter today is Tracy Angwin. Tracy is a corporate escapee with an obsession for improving payroll, compliance and efficiency. She is the Managing Director of Australian Payroll Association, which provides advisory services and training to the payroll sector. In 2013, she recently published her first book, The Payroll Revolution. Well respected by payroll suppliers and employers alike, Tracy often speaks at payroll conferences and events. She is regularly quoted in national and international media, offering commentary on payroll-specific topics. I'll now hand you over to Tracy to continue our presentation. Thanks, Vicky. Uh, thanks for that introduction, and, and uh, welcome everyone to the superannuation webinar, which I think is the last in our series um, of payroll webinars. And thanks also to the team at Reckon. They do a great job in supporting their clients uh, in the payroll function, and you know they understand that payroll is complex. So I'm very, uh, very pleased to support this initiative uh, for the Reckon clients. So. As Vicky said, I did publish uh, my first book. My second one's coming out in a few months. Um, and you know, if you'd like to get a copy of that book, just uh, go to thepayrollrevolution.com.au or just give me a call. I'll get one organised for you. But really what that is, is a, it's a compilation of the last 20-something years I've been in the payroll industry um, and really working with businesses from very, very small businesses to very, very large businesses uh, and, and really seeing all sorts of different payroll operations and uh, really getting a, an understanding of what typically goes wrong in payroll so it's, uh, and, and how to put it right. So that's rather than uh, have those conversations one-on-one, -on -one, I, I decided to write a book about it. But today we're going to talk about superannuation. And what I noticed in the, the past uh, webinars that I've, I've done for, for Reckon and Reckon clients is that we've had quite a few questions around superannuation um, which I've deferred back to this webinar. So um, I wanted to actually get back to basics just to start with to make sure that everyone's really got the, the, the basics right of superannuation. And I apologise if, if this is a little bit repetitive to the people that were on the first webinar because we'll just be going through some of the uh, topics that we went through but th then we'll get on to the, the real uh, nitty gritty of, of this webinar which is really where small businesses get superannuation wrong. So today we're going to look at, um, initially we're going to look at how much to pay and what elements that you need to pay superannuation on to be compliant. So superannuation is paid, as if you, you will know this, if you, if you were joining us on the very first webinar a month or so ago, um, superannuation is paid to eligible employees quarterly and it is at least 9.5% of ordinary time earnings. Um, to be compliant, you must provide your employees with a, a superannuation choice fund and those are eligible employees and you, you need to also be able to determine who's eligible and who's not. Employers also have an obligation to send the employee's tax file number to the super funds within 14 days. And you also have a, an obligation, and this is really something that um, a lot of employers get wrong, not just small business but big business too, is you you have an obligation to also pay contractors, eligible contractors superannuation. Just because someone is a contractor doesn't mean that they are not eligible to receive superannuation. And the, and the last thing that's really important from a compliance point of view is that you keep records of your contributions because if you do have a super audit, you will be, um, you will be required to, to prove through a series of documentation that you have paid superannuation and you've calculated superannuation in a compliant manner. So it's really, really important to keep records not only of your contributions but how they were calculated and we're going to go through that a little later on in this webinar. 
So how much super do you need to pay? Well, up until, and, and, and might I say I should have a big disclaimer on this slide because um, this is absolutely subject to change. Uh, it's certainly changed uh, with the change of government that we had um, almost two years ago. Uh, we've now got a, a hold on the 9.5% rate until the 1st of July 2021. Um, and then we've got uh, a series of increases to 2025 where we'll get to 12%. But clearly 2021 is a long time uh, between now and then. So I do expect that this will change. And so, so don't be setting this in stone right now. But all you need to know right now is that super's at 9.5%. We may get some more um, feedback uh, in a couple of weeks when the federal government, uh, federal budget uh, is announced. And um, if you get our, our newsletters, uh, we'll obviously keep you informed about that as soon as we know. And I'm actually going to be in Canberra for the budget, so um, we'll, we'll, we'll you know, have some commentary around that at the time, which will go through our newsletters. So 9.5%, but is there a cap on it? Well, th there is, and we call this a maximum superannuation contribution space. Now, this uh, is indexed every year, so again, you need to keep uh, whether you do this by, um, by membership to an organisation such as Australian Payroll Association or whether you, uh, you know, do this yourself and make sure that you are up to date with all of the uh, indexations each year or whether you, for example, uh, we provide uh, end of year seminars to all of our clients and our newsletter subscribers both online and uh, in a classroom environment. Either one of those three things. Uh, we'll make sure that you're up to date with um, with all indexation and one of the things that is indexed every year is this maximum superannuation contributions based. So this is the maximum earnings that an employer is liable for super for per quarter. Now it's really important to make sure this you don't annualise this figure, it is per quarter. So for example, if someone gets a bonus in a quarter, that is for that quarter only. So it is quarter by quarter. You can see how these figures have been indexed since 2011. So um, again, we expect to, in the next couple of months, um, certainly by sort of mid-June when our end of year seminars are, we expect to get the, the new uh, indexed figures for this and uh, all the other things that are indexed um, for the coming financial year. But at the moment, the quarterly amount for the, uh, for the next financial year is uh, just, just under $51,000. So what do you, uh, when do you need to beg your pardon to pay super? So these, the super is, is payable quarterly. Um, if you don't uh, pay by the quarterly deadlines, you will trigger the super guarantee charge. Now I'm hoping that most of you are not familiar with the super guarantee charge because um, it's a very expensive way to pay super. And again, we'll go through some calculations later on in this webinar about the super guarantee charge. But my advice to you is get super right the first time so you always avoid those penalties because they can be quite steep. So these, um, you have a copy of these slides so you'll be able to um, take note of when the due dates are for each quarter. In terms of uh, employees that salary sacrifice, um, Best practice is, of course, to pay these payments promptly, but there's actually no requirement for salary sacrifice or any superannuation contributions, in fact, in excess of 9.5% to be paid quarterly. So a lot of employers will actually um, pay additional superannuation um, for you know, sort of retention reasons. There are some uh, not-for-profit or uh, religious um, employers that uh, do tend to pay uh, higher superannuation. So other than the 9.5% that uh, you require to pay um, through the superannuation legislation. Anything else is, is not required to be paid quarterly. However, like I said, it is best practice to pay these payments promptly. So as we talked about in the very first webinar, um, super is 9.5% of ordinary time earnings. It is not super, it is not 9.5% of all payments paid to an employee. So once you've determined that super is actually payable for an employee, um, you should only be paying it on ordinary time earnings. So let's have a, a look at what ordinary time earnings are. And, and I apologise if this is repetitive for those of you who attended the first webinar, but it's very, very important because just as we don't want to underpay superannuation, because um, obviously that puts us in all sorts of uh, 
positions of potentially paying penalties and um, upsetting employees and getting uh, some fairly significant uh, financial deterrence around that. We also don't want to overpay superannuation because that's just uh, that's just silly. We shouldn't be doing that. Um, so we put together this ordinary time uh, earnings decision tree. It's a, it's a little out. It's not. It's actually normally a portrait. Um, um, a portrait flow chart which looks a lot easier to read. So, but in this example, I've had to make it a landscape just to fit this the slide deck. Um, but this, if you if you stick to this, you'll you'll get it right for ordinary time earnings. So let's have a look. For example, um, let's use normal time as an example. Is it a payment or an allowance? Well, it's it's a payment over here. Does it relate to overtime? Well, no. Ordinary times doesn't relate to overtime. Is this payment in relation to termination? Well, let's just assume that this is not a termination payment, so no, it doesn't relate to termination. Uh, does it relate to leave? Um, no, the ordinary time doesn't relate to leave. Does it relate to leave loading? No, it doesn't. Is it, does it relate to workers' comp? No, it doesn't. So therefore, you get down to this green box down the bottom here, which says that normal time is ordinary time earnings. You probably didn't need an OTU decision tree to figure that out. So let's have a look at leave loading. Is it a payment or an allowance? Um, some people actually call it a payment, some people call it an allowance. But either way, even if we go down the allowance track, is it a reimbursement or expense? No, it's not. Does it relate to overtime? No, it doesn't. Does it relate to termination? Well, in this example, if you're actually taking leave to be paid leave loading, let's say it doesn't relate to termination. Uh, does it relate to leave? Yes, it does. Does it relate to leave loading? Well, yes, it does. So therefore, you get into this orange box saying it's not ordinary time earnings. Uh, let's have another example. And then I, again, I think it's important to have a look at how uh, different payments might go through this. Uh, a Saturday penalty loading. So let's say that's an, an allowance. It's not an expense or a reimbursement. And because it's a Saturday penalty loading, it doesn't relate to overtime. It doesn't relate to termination and it doesn't relate to leave, nor leave loading, nor workers' comp. So Saturday penalty allowance is ordinary time earnings. So let's have a look at a Saturday penalty loading, uh, which is ordinary time earnings, compared to overtime. So is overtime a payment or an allowance? Well, it's a payment. Does it relate to overtime? Yes, it does. It's not ordinary time earnings. So this is one of the things that small business in particular get wrong often, is the difference between a penalty loading and overtime. One is ordinary time earnings, one is not. And the other one that um, is often got wrong is leave payment on termination. So let's have a look at that. So leave payment on termination, um, does it relate to overtime? No, it doesn't. Does it relate to termination? Yes, it does. Is it in lieu of notice? So if that leave payment was in lieu of notice, it's not ordinary time earnings. But say it's, um, it's not in lieu of notice. So, uh, sorry, it is in lieu of, I beg your pardon, I've just um, got myself confused there. If it's in lieu of notice, um, it, you come down this path. Does it relate to leave loading? Does it relate to workers' comp? So it is ordinary time earnings. So it's really, really subtle, but really, really easy, even as I did, to get, myself, get yourself tripped up over the, what, what, which payments are ordinary time earnings and which are not. But just use this, if, if you do nothing else, just take a, copy of this, put it in your office, and if you've ever got a, a question of whether something is ordinary time earnings, just work through this flow chart and you'll be able to, um, to find it out. But as we know, there's always an asterisk in payroll, which is why in the last slide there was an asterisk on the workers' compensation payment. So the issue is, and, and like many things in payroll, you can't just rely on one piece of legislation only. You always need to pay based on the most generous provision. That is um, the, you know, the, the Fair Work Act says that's what we should do. We've got all these different types of different pieces of legislation. We've always got to choose the most generous provision. So for example, in uh, workers' compensation, the actual ordinary time earnings legislation says that workers' comp is not OTE and therefore not superable. However, in many modern awards and agreements, and it's, they state that paid leave, including work-related injury or illness, where the employer is re receiving regular payments from the employer, are payable uh, or are superable. So they do have payments uh, of super paid on those payments. So therefore, the most generous provision is potentially one in your award or agreement, 
which would then override the ordinary time legislation. So it's really important to, um, you know, to, to make sure that you, you are being advised about all legislation that might affect a payment, not just something that you, you think is simple. Uh, you know, if it's silent in your agreement, well, it, it, it doesn't matter. That's the, a lot of times I see particularly small business get into problems because they've, in good faith, um, identified one piece of legislation and worked to that, but haven't realised there's another piece of legislation that's more generous. And small businesses are getting fined, really, for, for trying to do the right thing, but in error doing the wrong thing. So in terms of, um, just to make sure we, I haven't confused you completely, and again, a recap from our first webinar, ordinary time earnings include normal hours, shift loading, leave payments when you're taking leave, um, any unconditional uh, payments um, in terms of allowances, payments in lieu of notice and bonus. Many, many employers don't pay super on bonus. Really important to realise that that is ordinary time earnings. And the things that are not ordinary time earnings include um, expense reimbursements, that's um, fairly, self, fairly obvious. Uh, overtime is not ordinary time earnings. Leave payments on termination. Allowances that are fully expended. So look at your car and your travel allowances to determine whether they're ordinary time earnings or not and annual leave loading. So about the super guarantee charge, because many people talk about the super guarantee charge, including me, and the, um, and the need to avoid it. And this is the super guarantee charge um, is, is very, it's very heavy handed to be honest. So it's really, really important uh, to make sure your super payments are paid correctly and on time to avoid the super guarantee charge. So basically, if you don't provide the prescribed minimum level of superannuation contributions by the cutoff dates, you will be liable for the super guarantee charge, as well as additional penalties. One thing to remember, and this is um, uh, depending on how your payroll process works, but if you're paying your contributions via a clearinghouse, the, those payments are not considered as being paid until the actual date that the complying fund receives the payment. So just because you've sent it to a clearinghouse does actually not mean you've met your, um, your SG obligations. So really important to know that and, and make sure you understand the timings if you're, you're using a clearinghouse. So what happens or how can you trigger, how would you trigger the superannuation guarantee charge? So this charge is payable if you underpay your super, so you don't pay enough super for your eligible employees, if you pay your super late, um, if you don't pay super at all, um, if you don't pay the super to the employee's chosen super fund, so you pay it to the, a default fund instead of their, if they've exercised choice, um, and certainly you know, paying it after the cutoff dates of payment, that's, um, we've got to make sure we do that. So what is the super guarantee charge? It is a combination of things. It's the outstanding superannuation that needs to be paid that you've either underpaid or incorrectly paid or paid late, plus interest, plus an administration fee. The key to this though, the real kicker to the super guarantee charge is the actual payment, which includes the underpaid super, is now not tax deductible for your business. That's the real kicker. And, and this is where it really can hurt financially. So if you realise you haven't met your obligations or you know that you're not going to meet your obligation, you must lodge a superannuation guarantee charge statement by the due date and, and make the payment. Now, like I say, those, um, those charges are the, the actual SG shortfall, the interest, which is currently 10%, so you know, compared to the cash rate, it's very, very expensive. And then the administration fee is currently $20 per employee per quarter. So an example of this. Um, in this example, this is an employer that has 30 employees. The superannuation period is from the 1st of July 2014 to the 30th of September 2014. That's the quarter that we're looking at. Um, SG rate is 9.5% for that quarter. And in this particular example, just to make it as simple as we can, every employee is paid $12,500 in this quarter, and $2,500 of that is in overtime. So the ordinary time earnings 
for this quarter is $10,000 per employee. So if we were to pay the superannuation uh, guarantee correctly, we would take the, uh, the cost would be the super, the 9.5% on the $300,000. So that's $28,500. And if your employer pays that $28,500 into the employee superannuation funds by the due date, they have paid, they've met their superannuation obligations and the 28500 is income tax deductible for the business. So that's how super should be paid. If for any reason that super wasn't paid that quarter and uh, it was missed, whatever, there was a, there's now a, you've had a superannuation audit uh, two years after this quarter, which is a bit impossible because the quarter was only last year, um, <laughs> last year but say, say in uh, another year you get this, uh, this audit and we realise, the tax office realise that you haven't paid super for that quarter. How are they going to uh, calculate the super guaranteed charge? The first thing to, to note, and, and there's many, many ways that this really hurts businesses financially, the first way is that the actual super guaranteed charge is not calculated on ordinary time earnings. It's calculated on the full salary or wage amount, including the overtime. There's 10% interest from the date that the super was payable, plus there's the admin fee. So in this example, the total SG shortfall is a 375,000 times 9.5, not 300,000 times 9.5, but 375 times 9.5, giving a total superannuation of 35,625. There's interest from the beginning of that quarter at 10%, so we're looking at $14,600 in interest, plus an administration fee, which remember was $20 per employee for the quarter. So your total superannuation charge is $50,826, which is not tax deductible. So this is more than $22,000 in addition to what it should have cost, and plus their non-deductible costs. So everywhere you look, you're getting financially hurt by not paying your superannuation correctly. So um, if, you're, if you realise that um, you haven't paid your, super guarantee, your, your superannuation, um, but you have actually lodged the super guarantee charge statement because you realised it before the tax office did, uh, this is how the payments would, would look. So say that um, you, you, you re realised um, that the payments hadn't been made, the super guarantee charge statement was lodged on the 5th of December, so um, this is the, the quarter is from, from July to September, so a couple of months after the end of the quarter. The, S, the super guarantee charge is still calculated on the full salary and wage amount, not ordinary time earnings, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether you pick it up or the tax office picked it up, it's still unpaid. 10% interest still applies and the admin fee still applies. But the, the, the big change here, the, the actual SG shortfall is the same, the administration fee is the same, but the interest is different because we're, we're calculating from the beginning to the quarter to the time that the SG statement is lodged. So the interest in this case is just over $1,500, so the total super guarantee charge is $37,757. So still a little bit ugly, but not quite as bad as, um, as the former. So the advice is, of course, is if you realise you've paid superannuation incorrectly, fill out a super guarantee charge statement as soon as possible. So a couple of other things that I wanted to go through um, after um, <laughs> giving you all the bad news on the super guarantee charge. Um, other things that I see businesses, and like I say, not just small businesses, but all businesses um, getting wrong. And this one's... Um, really related to when employees ask the person who is um, providing or the payroll service, so either that be your payroll person or, or uh, the financial controller or the owner of the business for advice about super. And so let's have a, I wanted to go through what advice you can actually give to employees on superannuation. So the advice that you can give has to be pretty general. Um, you can give them, you can explain the process, you give them 
the, cho the super choice uh, forms. Um, you can explain, like I say, the process of choosing a super fund, but you can't tell them which one would suit them the best. So we've really got to be very careful just to stick to factual advice. So how to choose a fund uh, in, in that the process, not um, the investment choices. You can explain to them and employ what your obligations are for superannuation and what they need to do to nominate a super fund to pay the funds into. The issue is anything other than that, anything in addition to that, so anything about which super fund they should choose, how much they should contribute to super, whether they should consolidate their super, um, you know, anything, anything that uh, is to do with the, uh, the financial nature of their super that's outside of the super guarantee uh, that you're obliged to pay actually falls under financial advice. So unless you have a financial advice license from ASIC, which most, uh, unless you just happen to be uh, uh, in, in the financial advice or accounting uh, industry, um, you probably are not licensed as an advisor through ASIC, you can't give financial advice. And a really good example of this is um, we had uh, a client that we were doing a payroll compliance audit uh, for a couple of years ago and their payroll manager had, someone had Someone had come to them and said, how much, how much can I salary sacrifice? And the payroll manager told, gave them the information and said, you can salary sacrifice up to this limit or whatever it was at the time, which was fine. At the end of the, uh, at the, end of the year, this employee got a really big uh, tax bill because the, the payroll manager didn't know and A, wasn't licensed to give advice. Um, but because that employee acted on that advice, they had a had a big uh, a, a big tax bill, and it was because the employee had other uh, investments outside of um, outside of their salary um, that were contributing to their super, and therefore it pushed them over the cap, and they were taxed accordingly. So that's a really good reason. Um, practical reason why you shouldn't be giving advice because you, and, and why you actually need to be a financial advisor to do that because you need to understand the whole of the employee's financial uh, situation, not just what they get paid by you. The other topic I wanted to cover today, uh, which a lot of employers uh, don't understand and are getting fines for getting wrong is reportable employer superannuation contributions, and this is all about um, this is all about influence by the employee. So basically, the, the ATO um, require reportable employer superannuation contributions. You will often see the acronym RESC to be included on the payment summary. Uh, many employers are not doing this, and. The reason, the reason is, I suppose, the logic would be is that um, reportable super com, uh, contributions are not included in your assessable income, but they are added to uh, your assessable income for purposes of assessing a number of government benefits and schemes. So that would include, um, the most obvious is Medicare levy, so it's got to be on the payment side because the, the government want their Medicare levy on, on that, those uh, amounts. But other things that it, it affects are, are dependent tax offsets. Uh, senior tax offsets, super co-contributions, um, higher education loan programs, so HEX repayments, uh, and also child uh, support payments. So if you don't, and, and the key is here is if you don't include them, the ATO go after the employer with the penalties and fines. They'll also get their money eventually from the employee, but they go after the employer and there are penalties and fines. So RESC is um, payments that you make for an employee in respect of an income year where they had some influence over the rate or amount of super and that they're in addition to the uh, superannuation payments that you have to make. So there's all sorts of examples of where this might happen. Um, and certainly um, you know, any sort of salary sacrifice arrangement uh, and other sort of arrangements where an employer might opt to salary sacrificing part of a bonus, for example. Anywhere where that employee has influence over the amount, um, check to see that that's, if that's reportable. If it's reportable, it must go on the payment summary. And if it doesn't, 
uh, and you get you get an audit, um, you, you would, there are absolutely fines and penalties for getting that wrong. So in terms of uh, capacity to influence, uh, this is often a, um, a conversation that employers have with the ATO. And my advice to you is to get everything in writing. So if an employee uh, wants to uh, have some influence, make sure you get that in writing from them that is date stamped. Um, and then you've got something that's defendable. So as long as you obviously then do the right thing by that and, and, and execute that, that request. So in terms of um, employ uh, payments that are not reportable, that's often, a, that's often a better way to actually figure out what is reportable. So contributions that are not reportable is if the employee didn't or could not influence the amount. So if the employer states that this is how much that we're going to uh, on, on, you know, as a as a gift, as a you know a, a retention sort of bonus, we, we're going to contribute an, an amount to your superannuation that the employee can't uh, influence. Um, any contributions that are from their after-tax income are not reportable. Of course, this is only pre-tax income super, and any contributions that are made under an industrial agreement that the employee had no direct influence. So, if you've got an industrial agreement that says we pay you 12%, well, the employees had no influence over that. Um, and, and therefore not reportable. Preservation age is a question we get a lot, uh, and again because I think you know employees are also asking employers this, um, this information. And really, uh, this is all you need to understand preservation age. And preservation age is uh, the the age that um, an employee can access their super. So this is you know this is the table to work it out for for everyone born after 1st of July 1964 the preservation age is 60 and there's a you know a transition period uh, to age 55 so if you just happen to uh, turn 55 before the 1st of July this year uh, your preservation age is 55 so over sort of time in the next few years this will um, we won't need this this uh, table anymore, but in the meantime, use this table to work out preservation age. And the last thing I said um, at the beginning of this webinar that we really need to be um, uh, aware of is is the requirement of employers of keeping records. Um, again, this is really really important when, if and when you get a super audit uh, from the ATO. You've just got to be able to defend yourself in the decisions that you make. So, in terms of what record keeping is required to keep you uh, out of trouble when you do have that audit, um, really important to keep in writing how reportable contributions have been calculated. And this includes uh, getting something in writing, as I said, from the employee. It's also uh, wise to document how the employee influenced. The, the amount of the contribution, so that's uh, and, and have the employee agree on that, so it's not up for debate. The other things you need to be able to show, and hopefully you can you can show this through the calculations in your payroll system, but you need to be able to show how an employee's salary or ordinary time earnings has been calculated. So um, again, you need to have documentation, whether they are payroll reports or or other reports, to show that. You'll need to have any uh, copies of your any salary sacrifice arrangements again in writing from the employee, and any relevant industrial uh, agreements, of course, if you have if you're paying uh, additional superannuation uh, based on that agreement. Now, importantly, the um, the ATO wants you to keep records for five years after they are either prepared, obtained, or the transaction completed, whichever occurs last. So um, it's a just it's prudent just to make sure five years from any of those dates that you keep records. Um, and look, a lot of our clients uh, would would keep uh, their superannuation records for longer than that anyway, which I think is uh, is really best practice. And if if you're keeping other records for seven years, why wouldn't you just keep your super records for the same time? So they are the the main areas. I mean, there's, we could we, we actually have a superannuation course. There's, which I think the, the, the notes are sort of 50 pages long. Um, so there is much more to say about superannuation, but these are the things that we see employers getting wrong uh, the most and unfortunately uh, getting into 
um, situations where they have penalties and fines uh, for incorrectly paying their superannuation. And as you can see, once that superannuation guarantee uh, charge kicks in, it can be very, very expensive um, for the employer. Now in terms of, um, I did talk earlier on about how there were, um, you know, there, there's indexation and, and a lot of indexation relates to superannuation. So if you don't get our free weekly newsletter, please feel free to, uh, to register for that at our website, ostpayroll.com.au forward slash newsletter. We'll get you there. Um, we send that out on a Monday morning and um, you know, it's, it's really a, a, a good way to keep in touch with, um, you know, with what's happening in the payroll industry. Uh, we can't give you personal advice because you're a, a, a newsletter subscriber, you need to be a member for that, but we, can, we certainly push a lot of content down through uh, to our newsletter subscribers to make sure that you, you keep up to date with any payroll news. Um, we will keep. Uh, we have a, have an offer for wrecking clients. Um, you know, we we really uh, want to support wrecking clients because uh, wrecking putting on these webinars we think is a is a great initiative. To be honest, very few uh, software vendors do this um, as a as a genuine uh, add, adding value to their clients. Um, most, to be honest, a lot of software vendors when they do put on webinars, it is a it is a sales. Uh, a sales activity. Reckon have asked me just to share um, some some you know complimentary content with their clients that's going to help you uh, make sure that your payroll operation is compliant. And I, I really um, really take my hat off to Reckon to, for doing that. And as such, we have a um, we have set up a, a discount code uh, which is Reckon R E C K O N which will uh, allow you and, and look, to be honest, feel free to share it if, if, um, you know, among your, um, your colleagues. It will give you 20% uh, off all of our online and classroom based training, including our superannuation um, online course. And it will also give you 20% off our annual memberships. Now, uh, our annual memberships, um, most reckon clients I would suggest would use the, our standard membership, which gives you access to our help desk and all our Resources um, that is seven hundred and eighty dollars, uh, including GST, which you'll get twenty percent off. We also have, and we've had some questions about discounts on our small business membership and our personal membership, which is thirty dollars a month, which is paid by credit card. It's so discounted now, anyway. Um, we just can't put that twenty percent off that, but you know, it's it's thirty dollars a month, and. Uh, the, the main difference is, is you don't have access to our telephone help desk, you have access only by email. Um, it allows us to manage that um, quicker. So we, we can't give you the 20% off, off that because we would, um, you know, we, it's a fast way to go broke anyway. We, it's, it's very much, um, we, we just provide that to small business uh, at, at cost, we really do. So, uh, but annual memberships is fine. Um, Everyone who joins using that Reckon discount code will get a complimentary copy of my book, The Payroll Revolution. Uh, so we can also do that um, with no trouble at all for Reckon clients. If you want to contact us uh, for any other reason, please feel free just to give us a, a call or there's my, that, per, that, that email address comes straight to me. I, I don't have a, a PA that screens my email, so if you want to get in touch, please get in touch directly through that email address. Have a look on our uh, our website for any other. There's an awful lot of uh, complimentary con uh, content on our website anyway. Um, or give us a call on any of those numbers wherever it's closer to you. We'll be very happy to have a chat with you and just just remind us that you're on the Reckon uh, webinars and we'll be happy to help you out. So thank you very much again to Reckon for having me on these uh, series of webinars. And um, Vicky, I think it's been I, I think it's been a, a great thing for you to do to your clients, and I really um really look forward to, to answering any superannuation questions that they've got and um, getting those back to uh, to the subscribers on this webinar. That's great. Thank you so much today, Tracy. Um, thank you all for attending and participating. As I said earlier, um, if you submit any questions, we will endeavour to get them all answered. Tracy will go through them and we'll get um, all of them sent back to everyone along with the recording of the webinar today. Have a lovely day and we hope this session is to be of value to you and we'll see you at the next webinar. Thank you very much.